Welcome to episode two of the TDW show. We are in this next episode, episode two, we are going to be looking at a, another question that's come into us here at TDW around the role of the S1000 DCSDB. So we are going to try and reframe and look at the question from a slightly different angle and hopefully provide some information that will make your decision a little bit easier. Further to episode one, where we started looking at some of the software tools that we use, we are going to look at a next tranche of tools that we use specifically around screen capture. And so I hope you enjoy that. And Kieran Dodd will continue her journey through looking at the role of simplified technical English, how you can get the most and the maximum out of this specification. And she's doing that through a journey through the alphabet, the A to Z of STE. So we hope that you really enjoy this. In between all of the segments, I will give you some updates on what's been happening at TDW and some of the stuff that you can gain access to that you may not necessarily know has been available. So please enjoy this episode. So hello and welcome to this episode of the TDW show. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you are safe and well and have not been affected too much by this global craziness that's going on right now. Please accept my apologies for my hair. You know, I've gone back to my old 80s hairdo because Claire won't allow me to just shave it all off like I used to do in the 90s. And um, so I'm having to suffer through with my hair being a little bit longer than normal. A quick shout out to the uh, email that I got in educating me on the terminology around ships and boats and vessels for the uh, Navy from the last episode where I was in Portsmouth. Thank you for that. Uh, unfortunately, my background is in green, so not necessarily on or below water. So I appreciate that. So I hope you enjoy this particular episode of the TDW show. There's no interview this month, just purely because the guy that we were going to interview has been furloughed in the UK, which means that he's actually not allowed to do any work. So therefore we've postponed him to later on in the year, but we do have one lined up for next month. So do stick around because I've got lots of little pieces of information for you as we work through uh, this episode. And I'll tell you how you can gain access to some free resources and some important software news that's coming from the market. But in this first segment, I'm going to answer a question that I get continuously, either whether I'm training, consulting, or we get it in via our website regularly. Can we do S1000D without a CSDB? That's what I'm going to answer for you in this first segment. So welcome to the question that I get frequently when I'm doing my training or my consulting and actually is probably one of the most common questions that we get via our website. And that is the need or the requirement for a CSDB within an S1000D project. So I'm going to try and reframe this question and try and answer it for you and give you the actual information that you need in order to be able to make the judgment call yourselves on whether a CSDB is for you. So firstly, I like to try and reframe the question or repurpose the original question and I, I like to then flip it and say why is it you don't think you need a CSDB? Now in the main I have seen the general objections for adopting a CSDB is simply down to cost. The first thing that many projects, especially if they are coming fresh to S1000D, they don't know the intricacies of S1000D and what it's doing. The cost element of a CSDB is often the very first barrier to wanting to invest in the environment for an S1000D 
production tool set. So cost is always a big barrier. So is that your objection? So let's put away and put aside right now the technical issues that we may face if we don't have a CSDB. Is it because you think your project is too small for a CSDB? Your requirement is a pure and simple, maybe as low as you know 20 30 data modules i've even seen projects that have a couple of hundred data modules where they have tried to use a file management system as opposed to actually using something more functional like a csdb and some believe that their project just isn't simply complex enough and it doesn't need the actual s1000d csdb software behind them to actually get into the depths and intricacies of S1000D. So the question I generally reframe and I ask what are the objections to actually investing in something like a CSDB. Not only that, S1000D says that it's utilizing a common source database. Now we can debate what that means, but in order for us to understand whether we can answer this question intelligently enough, we have to step back and to understand what the CSDB is actually doing, we have to know what's going on in the background of our S1000D project. And a CSDB looks after many things for us and a good CSDB will do lots of this silently in the background that we don't really have to worry about when it comes to producing and delivering our content. So we have to be familiar with all of the intricacies of what's going on between the lines before we even start producing our actual S1000D content. But in order to understand what's going on in the CSDB from an S1000D perspective, we also have to understand what's going on within our modules and why our modules are produced in a certain way and what's the impact on how we produce content today to how we used to produce content and why the CSDB plays such a vital and critical role in our S1000D production methods. So the CSDB does lots and it's much more than just a simple content store, which is what a lot of people believe. You have to know all of this stuff that's going on around the S1000D processes and what's going on behind the actual platform uh, content production. So, but not only that, is that good software vendors will actually go beyond what S1000D says and they will actually produce lots of productivity gains if you are using a CSDB. And not only that, if we're using these productivity gains, we can also then have enforced QA processes on our authoring and production teams too. So the CSDB is a method of enforcing rules but also providing the ability for the authoring environment or the production environment to become much more efficient in the way that they actually produce their content. So the answer to the question, well, do you need a CSDB? Could you do S1000D with a file system with some low cost tools? Absolutely, if you wanted to do that. Is it the most efficient way of working with S1000D? No. So, you you know, there are ways that we can take shortcuts absolutely within an S1000D project, depending on how big your S1000D requirement is. But my recommendation to all of my clients, if they are embarking on an S1000D journey, is that where possible, you should invest in the tools. You should invest in the environment and the infrastructure to support you to get the absolute maximum out of S1000D. So don't ask yourself, do I need a CSDB? 
it's you should ask yourself what is it i'm going to lose if i don't have a csdb and depending on which csdb vendor you choose depends on the types of functionality and capability and interoperability and integration and all that kind of stuff that you get that's a completely different discussion and debate but you need to ask yourself can we realistically afford not to have a csdb and if you've done any of my training courses I give you lots of examples where projects have gone wrong because they've ignored vital components of an S1000D project. And one of the areas we cover is a CSDB. Let me know if you are not using a CSDB and if you are finding it a bit of a management nightmare or have you decided that you can do it without a CSDB? I'm always keen to hear from you. So there you have it. That's my two penneth on a CSDB. If you can afford it, it would make sense to go and invest in one. If you're looking for a CSDB solution, check out our website. We have links to all of the TDW vendor members that are supporting what we do here at TDW and those that are providing CSDB solutions all have links to their products. So do go check them out and um, go show them some love and at least go and get some demos. You'll be surprised that some of them are not as expensive as you would expect. And that's one of the biggest barriers that we see around our CSDB adoptions. Now, what we've done as well for the members of TDW is we've migrated the TDIQ content over to a new platform. So therefore now what we have done is merged a lot of our free resources with a lot of our premium resources. So we have announced an S1000D World Practitioners event that we're going to be releasing during May. And if you head to our website and you head to the online seminar link, complete a form there and we will send you details of how you can gain access to this practitioners event which is supported by some leading vendors in the market and I will also give you free access to not only the TDW magazine which you'll get for free but also we are developing an understanding augmented reality and technical publications tutorial which we are going to be making available free of charge too. The only thing we ask is that you will complete a short survey for us so we can actually gain an appreciation of what's going on with augmented reality in the market. So if you could do that for me, that would be perfect. So Kieran in the next section is going to pick up where she left off on Simplified Technical English in the last episode. If you have any questions specifically for Kieran, you can either contact her direct or link with her on LinkedIn or send them in via us here at TDW. We'd be more than happy to share them with Kieran and add them to the list of things that she needs to answer. So if you want to learn more from Kieran, make sure that you access our online version of the TDW magazine because Kieran is in there a lot. My name's Kieran Dodd from Kieran Dodd Training and I'm here with the second episode of the A to Z of STE. STE here stands for ASD STE 100 Simplified Technical English but because that's a mouthful I'm going to reduce that to STE. Mike has asked me to do these uh, weekly episodes for the TDW show because I have been training people in all sorts of different organisations and sectors in STE principles for the best part of 20 years. So I have lots to say about STE. So I was a bit unorthodox in the last episode and I started with S, T and U, but I'm going to continue with V and W today. And because uh, I had quite a lot to say about V and W and a lot of it refers to the STE specification, I decided to use some uh, PowerPoint slides so that you can see the detail as we go through. So my first V is for versatile, bearing in mind that uh, STE started life as a Ecma Simplified English in 1986. 
Uh, its original title was a controlled language for the creation of maintenance documentation. But as you see here, um, and as I mentioned in the last episode, the specifications title was changed to a controlled language for the creation of all technical documentation in 2017. And that's because although uh, STE is not designed for marketing or legal information specifically, it's a very versatile specification that also embodies a lot of good writing practice that you will find in, uh, for example, plain English, as we refer to it in the UK, or plain language, as it's referred to in the US, principles such as using short sentences and familiar language. The other area of versatility, again reflected in the 2017 issue, is that originally uh, STE, or ECMA Simplified English, came from the airline industry who asked the authorities to devise a language that would make maintenance documentation easier for non-native English maintainers to understand the manuals. But again, as you can see, although it started in, in aerospace and defense, it's now used in all sorts of sectors. For example, I've done training in automotive, agricultural, uh, semiconductor sectors. Another way in which uh, STE is versatile is the fact that the landscape of technical documentations is so very different now to uh, 1986 when we were focused on linear printed technical documentation. Um, we got a little bit more high tech when we went to PDF documents and I know that many organizations still use PDF but we're moving towards now um, augmented reality, Internet of Things, uh, interactive electronic technical publications, what's known as Industry 4.0, which embodies a lot of these new technologies. And STE is still very much um, applicable today as it was nearly 30 years ago. And the other way in which I'd say STE is versatile is that um, certainly for aerospace and defense, one of the new um, drivers uh, within particularly defense is the S series of specifications also produced by ASD. And um, STE used to be very much a standalone specification, but it is now very much a vital part of this S series of specifications that supports through life uh, documentation for uh, all different platforms. And STE is just as valid now as it ever was before. So those are just a few examples of how I see STE as being versatile. V is also for verb forms. Now, STE is a controlled language. And so if you've ever had to learn English grammar, either as a native English speaker or as a uh, English as a second language speaker, you may well remember that verb or action or doing words, however you want to refer to them, the tenses and forms of the verb are exceedingly complex. And there are many tenses in, in English language that don't exist in other languages, which adds additional complexity for users who speak a language that doesn't have a certain tense or for translation. So one of the ways in which STE controls the English language and the complexity of English is to restrict the verb forms that you can use. And these six here are what you are permitted to use. So the infinitive, the imperative is important because that's what you are required to use for procedural text, um, simple present, simple past, past participle as an adjective. There's a whole lot of explanation behind there and the future tense, which is a less commonly used tense, but it's still there if you need it. 
the eagle eyed amongst you will notice that the ing form which is commonly used in tech technical documentation is not a permitted verb form apart from very very explicit um, situations so if you happen to use the ing form a lot in your text then ste will uh, present a challenge if you are trying to implement it so v is for verb forms and the way or one of the ways in which uh, st operates as a controlled language to take the complexity out but what i say to to delegates when i'm training this is isn't it much better that you just need to focus on what you can do and not need to worry about any of the other tenses or form, forms that you're not permitted to use. The third V I wanted to highlight today is also related to verbs, actions, doing words, and that's what we know as voice. And I've highlighted here the um, the rule 3.6 so all the rules to do with verbs are in section 3 and you'll see here 3.6 says use only the active voice in procedural writing use the active voice as much as possible in descriptive writing now if you're not sure what we mean by the difference between active and passive You've got a couple of examples here, and in essence, it refers to knowing who's doing what to whom in a sentence. So here, the active voice, we're talking about the manufacturer who supplies the safety procedures. And the active is typically how we think and talk when we are describing actions. However, commonly in scientific, engineering and more formal writing, you see the use of this passive. So um, the safety procedures, so the things that are supplied come first, we know they're supplied, and then finally we find out that they are supplied by the manufacturer. So that's one indication of a passive where the person or the thing doing the action comes after the action in the sentence. The second example here the active voice says the side stay holds the main gear leg. So we know again what in this case is doing the action and who is receiving the action. But in the passive, the main gear leg becomes the main focus of the sentence and we're told it's held in this case by the side stay. Why is this an issue you might be asking? Well, in simple sentences like these examples, it doesn't matter whether it's active or passive. Why does it matter, I, I hear you asking? Well, STE is about making your text clear and unambiguous. Where you use the active voice, you have to be clear in your mind who or what is doing an action and so you have to be very specific in your writing where you have a lot of passive voice and in some cases you can have passives where we don't know who is doing the action or what is doing the action we just simply know that the safety procedures are supplied where you have a lot of passive it's a more complex way of writing it is vaguer and it's a lot easier to write poorly and hide it in the passive rather than the active so for me the active voice drives not only clarity and conciseness in what you write but also critically for writing in your thinking as well so that's why the active voice is uh, recommended not only in ste but also in the plain english or plain language principles that i was talking about earlier Good writing always recommends the use of the active voice unless there's a good reason to use the passive, but that is the outside the scope of what we're talking about. So that's V. Again, the W's are taken from the specification themselves, which is why I've put these illustrations here. All of the text you can find in the 2017 
issue of ASD STE 100, which you can download from the uh, ASD STE 100.org website. So, as I said, STE is a controlled language because it controls the complexity of the grammar that you can use. We saw that with the verbs, but also which words you can use. And rule 1.1 specifies that there are three types of words that you can use in STE. Words from the approved dictionary, words that qualify as technical names, and words that qualify as technical verbs. So below here, I've got an example of uh, one of the pages or a part of the page from the dictionary, which forms part two of the specification. Now, again, there's a lot of information here, which is outside of the scope of this uh, brief explanation. But the dictionary is important because it tells you which words are permitted. So in this case, focus is not permitted as a verb, but it is permitted as a noun. You would need to know your parts of speech. And you've also got approved and not approved examples. So the dictionary is a really important part of your learning process for working out what words you can and can't use. The second category of words that you can use are those that qualify as technical names. Now, STE is not uh, able to provide an exhaustive list of all the types of words that every industry could ever want to use. And again, one of the features of the last and current issue was that a lot of the examples that used to be very uh, aerospace heavy have been made much broader. But the point about technical names is if you can put your term that you wish to use into one of the 19 categories, I've put the first seven here with examples in, these are not exhaustive lists, then you can use them as technical names. And there are other rules in section one that tell you how you can use those words. The third category of words that you can use in STE are words that qualify as technical verbs. And again, there is a list of categories, and I've put some of them here, that if you have a, a verb or an action that you wish to use, then you need to check whether it is a part of one of these four categories. And there are a number of subcategories within each category. So the manufacturing processes, for example, if you want a term that, that refers to removing material, then you may use that. But again, there are, are quite a lot of rules around how you use technical verbs. And one of the main one being that you have to use the same rules as other verbs uh, in section three. The other W I have for you today are warnings. Again, versatility is a theme that runs throughout this uh, episode, because as I said to you earlier, one of the big changes in the current issue was that it was made much broader than aerospace and defence. Traditionally, when I delivered this training pre-2017 to companies that weren't in aerospace and defence, we'd have to modify our discussions about warnings and cautions, because not every industry follows the same um, traditions of, of specifying warnings as we do in aerospace and defence. Uh, this was recognised officially in the 2017 issue, where, as it says on the screen there, safety instructions tell the readers that procedures or steps in procedures can be dangerous or cause damage. So there is warning and caution that, that those of you in aerospace and defence will recognise, but this is the change here that it is possible that under other industries use different words or categories for safety instructions and what they're saying is you can still use your own uh, categories but 
try to make sure that or not always make sure that the contents obey the principles of rule 7.1 through 7.3 and i've indicated here what those uh, features are that you must start with a clear and simple command or condition you must use a correct word to identify the risk and you must give an explanation of the specific risk or possible result. So although you may use a different system, and I know when I've done work with the oil and gas industry, they've got a very different way of identifying their safety instructions, but you need to also take into account rule 7.1 to 7.3 as to how you format your uh, safety instructions. So, the third W here that I have for you is uh, the section nine on writing practices. And I like this section because if you want to understand the rationale and the thinking behind the philosophy almost of STE, the explanations under rule 9.1 are really worth reading. Although the rule itself looks fairly straightforward, in essence, what it's trying to say is when you're trying to write in STE, it's not enough just to try and take out the words that don't comply with STE and that will give you good content. Because STE, the art of STE is about deciding what your message is and then writing it in STE rather than trying to translate it from uh, standard English. And there's some good explanations and examples underneath rule point nine one, which are really worth reading. So that brings me to the end of this episode of the A to Z of STE. So thanks for that, Kieran. And I know that you're enjoying putting this series together. I'm enjoying watching it again. You know, let us know what you think about what Kieran's saying and um, what your experiences are with Simplified Technical English. In the last episode of the TDW show, I introduced the segment of some of the software tools that I use here at TDW, whether I'm training, consulting, or developing content for a client. And I'm continuing that, looking at two tools that I use when it comes to screen capture and which are my preferred methods for doing so. So welcome to my quick look and brief look at some software tools this month that I have in my technical communication suite library. Now, one of the main things that we have to do as content creators, whether that's a technical manual or whether it's something like an RFI or an RFQ or some kind of proposal response, we are doing things like screen captures. And for that, I use two tools. And I have a tool that is exclusively for PC, which is not as the flexible for those of you who know how I work. I like to work with both a Mac and with a PC. So the tools that I'm going to show you, one I use way more than the other, uh, but it's important to remember that the tool that I'm going to mention first and foremost is something called Robo Screen Capture from Adobe. And why is it important to mention this tool? Well, it's important to mention this because it becomes part of your subscription when you buy Adobe Technical Communication Suite. So if you go for the Adobe Technical Communication Suite bundle, you get this along with multiple other tools. Now, I know I've had a lot of questions around the Adobe TCS Suite and you want me to answer some questions. We're going to do more on that over the next few issues. But today we're just focusing on the ability to capture a screen area. So if I go to the capture button here in Robo Screen Capture, you can see I have multiple items that I'm able to capture, but I normally just use something called region. And what it will do is it will open up for me in the background, the tools that I've got all the pieces of software that I've got available. Now let's just say that I wanted to uh, capture this entire environment here. I can bang return on the keyboard and you can see that now it's opened up in Robo 
screen capture ready for me to do lots of kind of image editing that you would expect in a standard image editor. So something like, uh, you know, Microsoft Draw or something along those lines. So that's my first tool. Again, it comes as part of the Adobe Technical Communication Suite and it makes sense for you to use it. Now, of course, you could just use standard uh, keyboard shortcuts on either your Mac or your PC and then copy it into your editor of choice. That's entirely up to you. That's almost what this is doing. It is a little bit dated now, and in terms of functionality, it's lagging behind the next tool that I'm going to show you. So the next tool that I use is something called Snagit. Now, Snagit is a tool that I've used for many, many years, and it is super, super powerful and functional and cost effective. So you can see that here we have our stage, but let me just show you very quickly if I captured something. So I'm now on a Mac environment and I have lots of options available to me and I can capture, let's just say I want to capture this part of this particular image here. It will automatically load that into Snagit for me. Now what's also cool with this is that if you use Snagit and you have a keyboard shortcut configured on your machines, PC or Windows, it will automatically copy it over into the Snagit environment for you. So you can make the association between your keyboard shortcuts and over to the software itself. But what I really like, not only is Snagit super easy to use, it's cross-platform, so I can use it on both Mac and PC. I can do simple things like drive a user's attention to certain areas of an image. But what I love about this new version of Snagit, this is the 2020 version, is that I can start including things like annotations here, if I want those annotations to be in here. So now you can see that I can start putting together stepped instructions very quickly for my end user. What Snagit actually comes with as well is a library environment. So now I can have all of my screen captures and I can include them and store them in my own personal library. I can add tags to that library so I can then find the content much quicker and much easier. But what is also really cool about Snagit is you can make things like animated GIFs really easily, which is something we're seeing more and more inside our technical communication, especially our more interactive deliverables. In fact, all of my training, we have animated GIFs, so we can actually show the process of something working. So those are my two main areas that I use. So I use Snagit probably more so these days because I can use it on my MacBook and I can use it also on my PC. Uh, but sometimes, occasionally, if I'm just using, I've got a little Surface Pro that has the technical communication suite on but doesn't have Snagit on. So I can, if I need to do a quick screen capture, I can use RoboHelp. So those are the tools that I use. What tools do you use? Let me know. I would love to hear from you and see what tools that you're using for your screen captures. If you'd like more information about how I use these tools, create your account over on the TDW portal and you'll see and learn more about both of these tools. So those are my two main tools that I use when it comes to screen capture. I have to say Snagit really is the tool that knocks it out of the park for me. I uh, use it pretty much all day when I'm doing uh, tutorials or whether I'm putting together animations or whether I'm doing a proposal for a client. That'll be my tool of choice. Let me know what tools you use and I'll be more than happy to take a look at them, do a review and uh, I'd be keen to see what other options are available out there for us. Now talking about software, some super exciting news. The guys at Corel have announced that they are develop developing and delivering over the next few weeks some new S1000D capability in their Corel Draw products. And the guys at Corel have asked me to help promote the fact that they are looking for beta testers of their tools. So if you would like to gain access to some beta software so that you can then 
work directly with one of the leading software vendors in our market, you can follow the link or contact us and I'll show you how you can register as a beta tester for Corel and gain access to some of their software. So that's it. That's the episode two of the TDW show is over and done with. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the view from my garden here. We've had some little ducks out the back. We've had some chicks that have nested and um, it, we, it's, it's been a really weird and strange spring for us here in the UK. I don't know what it's like for you wherever you are in the world. I know that, you know, I, I've trained some guys in Brazil, Argentina, uh, the States during the lockdown, and it is a very strange time. So in the next episode, I'm going to be looking at the role of the DMRL. Kieran's going to be picking up uh, her A to Z of STE. We have an interview lined up with a leading player in the market. And I'm also going to look at two other pieces of software that I use regularly here at TDW. Make sure that you like, share, subscribe, create your account over on the S1000D World website. Join in the love with the S1000D World Practitioners event and complete the survey on augmented reality and I'll share with you our augmented reality tutorials when they're available. I'm Michael Ingledew. I'm all about making you successful with your technical documentation, your technical information strategies, until episode three.